Hi everyone, this is the Chuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today we're going to take a look at the astrology of August. It's hard to believe that it's already August 2020. Uh, 2020 has been quite a roller coaster ride, and um, this month is maybe one of the busiest months. I don't think it has the most intense transits of the month. Like I could totally be wrong about that, but my sense is that eclipse season last month. You know, we've had some Jupiter Pluto conjunctions, Saturn. Uh, Saturn Pluto conjunction to start the year. Uh, this month does not strike me as the crazy month, but it's a really busy month. There's a lot that happens, so I'm looking at quantity of transits being a really big deal. A lot of them are pretty fast moving. Um, so again, what I'm tracking this month is really the abundant, like from start to finish. There are oftentimes when I do transits, you guys know transit forecasts for the month ahead. There'll be little clusters of really dynamic intense transits and then the rest of the month you know there might be lulls here or there uh, but this month really from start to finish is pretty busy so um, you know I'll, I'll do my best to give you uh, my, my breakdown of these transits but as always I hope that you'll also share your experiences as the month unfolds uh, come back to this video share your stories in the chat box so that we can all see how these transits are affecting you personally of course we've watched the news and the media a little bit don't go crazy with it but um, you know just to see what's happening in the world and how these transits might uh, match up with what's happening in the world <clears throat> it's always a great way to learn astrology all right so we're starting on august 1st and on august 1st there's a couple of things happening right away uh one is that the sun is moving into a square with Uranus. Now, I've actually talked about this already on my YouTube channel, but uh, I want to mention it again because it is the first transit of the month. And um, essentially what's happening with this transit is you have <clears throat> the potential for those illuminating insights or moments of clarity or a shifting of paradigm. Uh, the Uranus-Sun dynamic is very electric it has that feeling of being liberated off into higher states of awareness or, um, you know, kind of having those aha moments that can come through um, when the sun contacts, uh, contacts the Lord of revolution and, uh, you know, defiance and rebellion. So I, I personally really like these transits because, um, and I mentioned this before, sun Uranus transits almost always seem to result in very inspired states of consciousness for me personally. But um, <clears throat> they can also be, uh, they can also challenge the status quo and defy convention in ways that are sort of troubling. Um, so watch for those experiences um, in particular right around the very beginning of the month, right? Starts the month off just like that. Now, um, when you go into August 1st and uh, 2nd, you've also got Mercury come right off from an opposition to Pluto. So that's that you know, dynamic and very cathartic, intense, deep, heavy energy it could be very emotional, mental, colors our communication with other people to start the month. It can also be about hidden things that come to the surface or things that are being revealed and understood uh, for the first time. So you think about uh, the the revelation of Pluto that that brings things up from the unseen or the invisible realm. And Mercury is a good messenger too. So dynamic, transformative, pivotal um, messages being delivered during this time. Not all easy, some sobering, some more emotionally painful news or events <clears throat> uh, that, that you may receive right around this time. So also you're thinking coming off from the, at the beginning of the month that, you know, that transformative communication could go right along with that sun Uranus dynamic to provide some kind of uh, breakthrough or inspired uh, moment of of liberation from something in the pa something in the past, or perhaps some kind of limited idea that you have about yourself or someone else, or an environment, or you know, and they, they, these breakthroughs can also be quite you know quite profound spiritually, philosophically. We can have our entire par a paradigm or a thought structure altered fundamentally. So that is the Mercury opposition to Pluto now. Um, <clears throat> when we get to August 3rd, go forward just a little bit more, and you're going to see Mercury go into an opposition with Saturn. Now, this has a similar, it's a similar feeling to Mercury's opposition to Pluto because Saturn and Pluto are, of course, together right now. So it could be a continuation of some of the same themes. But Mercury-Saturn oppositions often bring these moments of, um, say, 
if you're in a con- contractual negotiation and suddenly two people say, we're cutting off negotiations because we can't come to an agreement. Uh, similarly, Mercury and Saturn are sometimes will result in a cosmic no or a cosmic weight or a cosmic negation, contraction, limitation, or restraint of some kind. Uh, one that has to be maybe navigated carefully because em- em- emotions are running over. Um, but also it can be about speaking, communicating through difficult topics with care, with sensitivity and with care. Uh, there can also be um, breakdowns in you know, travel, communication, cars, uh, technology, where you know, sometimes there's just a website you really need to need to, to use is like down for the day. There's just, you're just getting the cosmic no from like technology. Um, but Mercury Saturn oppositions, I personally, if you have any kind of creative project, let's say that you're writing something or you're making it, you're teaching a class and you're developing your curriculum or something that, you know, something mercurial that can crystallize and um, where the persevering stick to of Saturn can lend a hand and help Mercury to complete something. Also, agreements that are long-term, that are hard-fought, that are a long time coming, uh, those are Mercury-Saturn dynamics as well. This can also be about mental control and rigidity um, versus mental fluidity. Uh, Those themes can also come up. So watch for those right around the beginning of the month as Mercury goes to the opposition to both Pluto and Saturn by really by the third. Now, when we get into the, um, on the same day, the third, into the moon cycle now, we've got a full moon on the third. Now, the full moon is in Aquarius, and so you want to look for the, the whole sign house of Aquarius in your birth chart and note that whenever there's a full moon in a house in your birth chart, you're going to notice that the topics of that house are more illuminated and important, at least temporarily. So if this were a birth chart, for example, it's just a random chart, but um, you know, we'd have a full moon in the second house of finances and money. So you can kind of imagine the full moon is going to illuminate the importance of those topics. Um, now, this full moon is also um, in a loose square to Uranus and the, the sun. Uh, it's about a couple of degrees off. So, um, but that still means that this full moon is very Uranian. It's about liberation. It's about sudden, unexpected disruptions to the status quo in our life, which may be very illuminating. Sometimes they're a little destructive in the process. Uh, we have to sometimes break down mental, emotional barriers, and sometimes shock is a part of the Uranian signature. And Uranus is really present this month with the sun square Uranus to start the month of August with the full moon in a square to Uranus. So watch for those Uranian themes as well. All right, um, we go forward right around the third and the fourth. Another really interesting transit that's happening is you can see that Venus is conjoining with the north node of the moon. Now that's Rahu in Indian astrology. If you go from a kind of Indian perspective, even from an ancient Western perspective, um, the North Node can amplify or increase the sort of desire uh, body of Venus, which is to say you can make big purchases or you can <clears throat> fall in love with something or someone that's pretty shiny. You know what I mean? Uh, it doesn't always last or you have to be careful of how it may entangle you in the future. At the same time, um, Venus in the North Node could spell the amplification, just simple increase or general growth or proliferation of Venus themes. You know, sometimes if Venus conjoins the North Node, you're going to get a raise, you're going to fall in love, you're going to have the best, you know, physical hookup that you've had in a long time, or you're going to rekindle your romantic relationship with your significant other. But there's this this kind of buzz and amplification of Venus, goddess of love, beauty, friendship. Sometimes allies enter your life that are really important to you somehow, or even the topic of um, friends or siblings, which Venus can sometimes, you know, represent, especially sisters, but can represent either. And the importance of those topics or what's happening in, um, you know, friends or siblings' lives can be really important. Um, And sometimes there's benefits that come through friends or allies uh, as well. Now, again, the maybe the beware of Venus in the North Node is just, you know, the North Node in the Indian tradition can be sort of lusty, like, give me that, I want that. And, um, you know, that can, that can actually entangle us in future karma that may not be so easy to get out of. So we should be careful. <clears throat> There's sort of a buyer beware a little bit around that signature. But 
you know, on a more mundane level, we live in the world and, um, you know, if you're in business or uh, any number of, <clears throat> let's say, um, you know, industries in the world where you have to try to develop something, market something, et cetera, um, you know, this is a great time for, let's say, designing a new strategy to make something attractive or appealing or, you know, something that you need to shift something so that it's more beautiful, comfortable, available, accessible sort of Venus themes. Uh, this is a good transit. So anyway, pay attention to that uh, right around the third and the fourth. Um, <clears throat> this is a lot just in the first four days of the month, right? If you go to August 4th, oh, right away, Mars is going to square Jupiter. Now, Mars square Jupiter has been applying for a while. I could tell that it was applying just so that, you know, we all can laugh about this. I could tell that it was applying when I was on vacation to see my mother. Um, is it a vacation to go see your parents? I think it is. My mom's pretty cool, so <clears throat> says the cancer. Um, so uh, when I was home, I started watching Ken Burns. I don't know if you guys know who Ken Burns is. I, I started watching his like, 20 hour long documentary on the Vietnam war. And I was, and I was like completely, I mean, it was so fascinating. I knew very little about the Vietnam war compared to what I thought I did, <clears throat> you know, watching it was really illuminating. So, um, but I, I was like, where is this? Like, what is this? And I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mars is really super jacked up right now. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, um, Mars is like at the gym pumping iron right now, the favorite environment, <clears throat> you know, in Aries. And, uh, and, and then, you know, is squaring, is moving into the square with Jupiter, which is like, do you guys remember the, um, SNL episode where they were like these German bodybuilders, Hans and Franz. Do you remember them? We are Hans and Franz. We're here to pump you up. It's like Mars and Jupiter right now. That's, that's their story of the moment. He's got a really like sort of um, amplified and expanded and muscular. You know, Mars Jupiter can be associated with things like steroids, as well as like bodybuilding competitions and military and war and the bravado of warriors and athletes. Um, it can also be about military conflict. Uh, so there, are, it's a possible that those kinds of themes will intensify in the month of August. Quite frankly, it would surprise me with Mars about to go through a retrograde in September if we didn't see the escalation of of themes of violence, militarism, police, armies, stuff like that, weapons, um, laws surrounding things like weapons and warfare. Uh, you know, those themes are very much like the second half of 2020 in general, but. That's Mars for you. <laughs> and if it helps, if it's really like, if it's really gnarly, you can just think of Hans and Franz and maybe they'll make you laugh a little along the way. But, you know, Mars, Mars Jupiter is also, if you're on a mission, if you have a crusade, if you need to put your life or your energy or something on the line with some degree of risk and sacrifice, remember that Mars is a sacrificial energy and can speak to, um, you know, can, can speak to that. It's also really interesting to me that Mars is going to go retrograde this year. And you have a lot of professional sports um, leagues that are going forward with a sort of COVID plan. And it, I think it's, it's totally possible that seasons end up getting canceled or withdrawn or greatly delayed specifically because the God of athletics, Mars is going to go retrograde. For example, in the middle of football season this year, that will happen. It's already starting to happen in baseball. I saw a headline yesterday that said the Miami Marlins team, like 11 players were tested, tested positive for COVID. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just be real about that. This could also affect the larger global, you know, gladiator arena of professional sports. That's such a Mars Jupiter thing. Um, so watch for the Mars Jupiter contacts. Again, like if you need to work hard and sort of, um, you know, exert strength. It's a great time to get in shape or to work out or return to sort of some kind of athletic, like, or exercise activities. Those things are really like, just the kind of like, let me exert my, my muscle, my will, my life force in order to feel stronger or better. But at the same time with Jupiter in such a sort of corrupt position in its fall in Capricorn with the, you know, with, with Pluto hanging around and so forth, um, you know, this is also that, uh, that moment where that, that, what's that phrase that everyone's using now? Uh, toxic masculinity. 
that could definitely be there. But there, what's the difference between to- toxic masculinity and healthy masculinity? And not just if you're a man, but really, let's just call it healthy yang versus unhealthy yang. Uh, that might be a question for the rest of the year. But this month, you'll start to get a taste for it before Mars turns retrograde. All right. So if we go to uh, the seventh, well, look at this. Venus is finally going to leave Gemini. It's been there since April, and now it's finally going to enter Cancer. I just think that's worth mentioning. I don't have anything grand to say about this, not till later in the month when uh, Venus starts to uh, do things like, you know, try Neptune, oppose Pluto, oppose Jupiter, uh, eventually oppose Saturn in early September. But, you know, initially it's just sort of like, oh, look, (laughs) Venus is in a new sign. Um, So check that ingress in your birth chart because you know, ch- look at look back on where Venus has been in your birth chart since April through this big retrograde. What kinds of themes and changes has Venus brought along? Um, w- look at the whole process. And then note, now Venus is ingressing. Now, Venus won't stay like a whole long time in, in Cancer compared to, you know, being in a re- retrograde in a sign and spending so long in Gemini. But it is important to just see where it's at in your chart right away and note the the sign position. A Cancer Capricorn still has some more, that axis still has more to say to us um, this month, uh, especially because of Venus getting back into Cancer and doing some oppositions at the toward the end of the month. Mercury, of course, in Cancer at the beginning of the month. So the, the Cancer Capricorn axis is still lit up this month thanks to this ingress. Uh, okay. Now, uh, August 9th and 10th, if we go forward just a little bit there, Uh, Mercury is going to square Uranus. And like the sun square to Uranus, this is one that I really like. If you think about inventions, um, and inventions can be in art, music, technology. Um, It it could be the, you know, the electric teacher that enters your life somehow or somewhere, or the new subject matter that really turns you on, um, or the, um, the new skill or the new piece of technology that you get that makes life suddenly easier. Um, Mercury Uranus is such a, um, it also has a real trickster energy to it where, you know, unexpected things can happen that disrupt the norm, but that deliver these amazing um, insights or unexpected bursts of inspiration. Mercury Uranus can be a little dangerous when it comes to technology. Like, you know, like don't stick a, (laughs) don't stick a fork in an outlet or, or like, um, you know, get electrocuted or something. But um, obviously that's extreme, but Mercury Uranus is sort of like, you, you'll, you will see like auto accidents, kind of weird freak, um, freak accidents often around travel or transit that will occur. And also um, erratic disruptions um, in say the marketplace or in say, um, you know, if you're if you're someone who's trading every day or working in a busy mercurial place, which could be like a subway or an airport or a place of commerce that's really busy, like a mall or something like that, this is one of those energies that when it comes along, it can be very bustly and erratic. Like when you know, you know, suddenly something goes public for the first time and the trading floor goes nuts or something like that. I don't know. I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Um, but also, uh, you know, chaos can enter and uh, disrupt the normal um, ways of business or operating. You know, the, the normal, the status quo can basically get upset very quickly. Um, and, but oftentimes there's a really kind of meaningful message behind the, the chaos or the um, sudden kind of bursts of unexpected events that, that, ac- that occur. All right. So if we go forward to the 12th and the 13th, um, between the 12th and the 13th, Mars is going to then square Pluto. Now, Mars-Pluto aspects, I have to say, are a little bit more dangerous and volatile as far as I've tracked them throughout my career. Um, Mars-Pluto tends to be very explosive and often involves these kinds of showdowns or confrontations or... um, almost like, um, you know, the environment is like real intense and forceful and aggressive. And oftentimes the theme of power versus powerlessness, um, 
confronting things and upheaval and uh, transformation with an edge of intensity, risk, or danger are often a part of it. Um, something, things that are kind of more explosive. Uh, the pot is boiling with Mars squaring Pluto, so you do want to be extra careful of that at this time. Now, it's good that this Mars is picking up a trine from the Sun in Leo. That should lend a little bit more stability, and what do I want to say, like um, just clarity, and um, you know, the Sun cares about doing the honorable thing. So it's nice that that's coming in here. It might temper or soften it a little bit, um, but you want to be careful of the volatility of the moment. Um, at the same time, you know, if you're looking for, if you're waiting for a catharsis or something dynamic to change or transform, you may feel the momentum, you know, sort of peaking, and and it may help you to make the breakthrough that you need in any area of your life. Um, so, but you have to be careful of, again, sort of the militaristic side of, of Mars, the willful, it's got to be my way, kind of overpowering dark lord energy of, uh, of, of Mars with Pluto there. All right, so that's the 12th and the 13th um, with Mars as square to Pluto. Um, when we go forward to um, Mercury's Kazemi on, you know, what is it, the 17th. So Mercury will be Kazemi on the 17th. The reason I like this Mercury Kazemi is that it's got a trine, pretty close trine to Mars. There's a very empowered sun in its own sign with Mercury Kazemi and both are pretty tightly trined to Mars. I like this as like an executive order, an executive decision, um, this kind of strength that's in the, that's there along with sort of honorable qualities. So for me, like I'm, I'm sitting here going, um, this is doing the right thing, the hard thing, the good thing, and finding the courage to do it, um, you know, regardless. Now, this accompanies a, this goes, comes right in line with a new moon on the 19th. Uh, so, is it the 19th? Uh, I think it's the 19th, yeah. Yeah, it's, well, it's the 18th going into the 19th. So eight, evening of the 18th and the 19th, if you're on uh, the East Coast here in the United States, like I am. Um, so, uh, you know, the new moon in Leo is um, one of the reasons that I like this new moon is that, um, you know, when you have a, a kind of pure solar energy at the start of a new moon, there's often a way in which the best, the most honorable, the, the, the most special um, uh, aspects of ourselves will be called forth. Um, of course, you know, the Leo, uh, Leo new moon can some, sometimes call forth issues around fathers, around pride, around arrogance, around ego, the shadows of those kinds of things. But I like, I, I'm always reminded of the fact that, you know, Leo is a sign where it's the middle of summer, but from the symbolic interplay of light and dark in the northern hemisphere that ancient astrologers were considering leo represents the middle of summer when the light is starting to decline and die so why put the light the symbol of luminosity the sun in that sign why give it to that sign and one of the reasons is because the light is best held in this world by people who understand their own mortality who understand their own frailty and who therefore walk with humility in the world, serving something that is bigger than themselves. These are the people who are truly great. And so a new moon in Leo with the trine to Mars, I like to think about it as kind of heroic activation of our best selves, our most honorable selves, our humble, uh, you know, the, the humility in us uh, that is also motivated to act and do things and, and follow some kind of calling. Um, so that's what I'm thinking of for this Leo new moon. I really, I really like the looks of this new moon. Um, got some really good support from Mars. And of course, Mars is being tempered by Saturn. Um, Mars is going to square Saturn on the 24th and the, through the, about the 26th of the month. And uh, I'll just show you that really quick. And that Mars energy is being tempered by and um, shaped by that very mature Saturnine quality which is usually, I think that's a very good thing. Uh, sometimes it can be, again, a kind of about militar, militaristic, overly austere, controlling energy. But, um, you know, this is a Mars that 
says, I will do the mature thing. I will work within limitations. I will work within a constraining or difficult situation with perseverance and with, um, you know, for some kind of fortitude. And I like that behind this kind of honorable Leonine new moon uh, as well. So uh, the, the Mars Saturn energy, I think is very constructive. Saturn is in the superior position over Mars. So really, you know, and in the exaltation of Mars. So, so really is going to get the best out of Mars and is going to help shape Mars into kind of, um, you know, like the, like uh, if you think about the, that kind of the classic story of, um, you know, the, uh, the kid who is sort of reckless and angry and he gets put into like martial arts school and he learns to like, you know, channel his anger through a, a, a sort of sacred martial art form. You kind of have that feeling in the air this month. That's what I what I really like again about the new moon in Leo too. Is it adds to the feeling of like, like let's use this Mars energy in a kind of honorable way. Okay, so now between the nineteenth and the twentieth of the month, the other thing that I want to mention is that Mercury is going to enter its exaltation and rulership in Virgo. It's a really empowered Mercury starting around the twentieth of the month. Um, that's a big deal because of course the sun is also about to move into Virgo. Mercury will therefore be in its chariot, which means it's a little bit more protected from the beams of the sun, uh, which it would be under and combust, nor it would normally be combust. But Mercury is, is becoming really empowered, um, very quick, you know, very quickly around the 20th, uh, right after separating from that Kazemi with, um, the sun around the 17th. So, um, this is a Mercury that's going to pick up its strength uh, significantly. So you can look at the Virgo house in your chart and note that things will get quite powerful right around that time. And that's, that's another, I think, a boon for this month, an empowered Mercury, uh, especially, um, you know, the sign of Virgo, so practical uh, and, and oftentimes so helpful. So if you think about you know, a lot of the times the grandiosity of fire signs. We got a lot of fire coming in around that time too with the new moon in Leo, trine Mars and Aries and so forth. But, you know, that practical Saturn in Capricorn and then this really nice earthy um, Virgo energy that's going to start stepping up is really going to say, look, whatever the grandiose thing in the world that, you know, whatever the grandiose thing is, if it's coming from the best intentions, you know, it better be practical. It better get the details right and um, and really be useful. You know, a question that I think Virgo asks often is whatever I'm doing, whatever skill I have, there's a, a level of care, concern, even sacred worry about being useful, being helpful. Um, and I think that this Mercury is um, going to be the type of Mercury that starts to provide a lot of detail-oriented plans and solutions to, to help us implement things. So uh, that's, uh, that's a, it's, it's nice to have that around. Uh, for example, like we're moving, like I've, I've mentioned a few times, we're moving. Well, we're moving right around that time. I'm super stoked that Mercury is going into Virgo because it's exactly the kind of energy you want to have around when you're trying to attend to all the details of like, you know, cleaning out a space, getting ready to move into a new space. A L- lot, of, lot of things floating around, a lot of loose ends that can easily sort of get overwhelming. And Mercury and Virgo has a way of being very attentive and practically helpful. So that's, uh, that's, that's good. I'm looking forward to that one. But let me know how it goes. All right. So um, later in the month, 25th and the 26th, I told you there's a lot this month, um, Venus will oppose Jupiter. Now that happens uh, right around the 25th, 26th. I'll just draw it out so you can see it. There's the opposition. Um, and then right after that, between the 30th and the 31st, Venus will also oppose Pluto. Uh, I have it pointed at Saturn. Sorry, it's supposed to be Pluto. But then early September, it'll also oppose Saturn. So once again, we have that Capricorn and Cancer access highlighted. Now for me, Venus-Jupiter aspects often point to like opulence and wealth and sort of um, potentially like uh, represents that that energy of overdoing something or of one's appetite being too big. I always remember the Venus-Jupiter aspect that was there in the sky when we had a, a friend of ours got married at Disney world and we went down to Disney world and we were like, okay, we're going to like take our daughter for a day to the, you know, to the magical kingdom or whatever. And I was walking around and I was like, 
this is very magical. Like even as an adult, like it was very magical for me. I'm not going to lie. Um, but it was also so over the top Coca-Cola buy stuff, consume stuff. I mean, I was just like, it was like half like consumerist crack nightmare and half magic. I guess that's how I would put it. I'm sorry if you like really love Disney world. That was just my experience. And I was like, yeah, this is so Venus Jupiter. They might've been in a square. I can't actually remember which aspect they were in. It was either square conjunction or opposition. But anyway, um, so that feeling of Venus and Jupiter really being, you know, Venusian things being greatly amplified and expanded in this kind of grandness and beauty and stuff like that. Um, but it, it also comes, you know, with Pluto there, there might be something a little subversive or dark or, um, you know, like scandalous beneath the surface that will emerge during this time toward the end of the month as well. This is the kind of time, for example, that I'm, and I'm not kidding you, you know, 10 years of doing this, it's like, usually it's like when people get this natal transit, Pluto to their Venus or Jupiter to their Venus by opposition, they have some kind of scandalous affair and then it comes to the surface or someone that they know or love has an affair and it comes to the surface and it could be like a family member or it could be their own spouse or whatever. But, and I'm not trying to plant that idea in your head so you get all freaked out about it, but it is the kind of thing where it's like, you end up paying somehow for some kind of overindulgence. You could, you go over the top with something and then the bill comes due. And that's, um, that's the oftentimes the kind of Venus, Venus, Pluto or Venus, Jupiter, a little heavier and a little bit more dark and maybe even like, um, you know, um, intense or sometimes even violent and explosive with Pluto. But Jupiter is often that kind of pride or arrogance or vanity that, that, sometimes Venus will exhibit uh, when in contact with Jupiter. Now, on the other hand, this is also the, um, if you want to think about art that is dark, grand, big, beautiful, I think, for example, of um, like the Phantom of the Opera, you know, it's kind of a Venus, Jupiter, Pluto. Um, uh, if you've ever, if you've ever seen the Andrew Lloyd Webber production, um, but also you could think of other, you know, um, uh, what am I thinking of? Um, like Tim Burton, for example, also where there's just kind of this dark subterranean beauty to the aesthetic. Um, though that quality will be sort of in the air though, so watch for it. It can also be a time of great upheaval and transformation for relationships, friendships in general, sometimes with tinges of family karma involved because of Venus's involvement with cancer right now, perhaps. Um, okay, now... Um, Venus is also trying to Neptune uh, right, right around the same time. So that should add like a nice misty, uh, misty otherworldly layer in there. We'll be talking more about that later in the month in particular. Then at the very end of the month, as if that's not already a crazy amount of transits for the month, um, you're also going to see Mercury right around the 30th, 29th, 30th, 31st go through an opposition to Neptune. Now, Mercury is really strongly dignified, um, but anytime Mercury and Neptune go together, um, for me, like those are some of my favorite times in prayer and meditation because I have a daily practice and I've really noticed that when Mercury and Neptune get together, there's often just this way of being really dialed in, being able to almost enter a flow state. If you're a musician, an artist, a writer, I find these states to be really nice um, for that kind of experience um, or just connecting with others in ways that are unexpectedly fluid or emotional or um, sometimes this is can also be about the rational mind getting broken down a little bit and um, you know can be great in terms of spiritual teachers or experiences or lessons kind of coming through or messages messengers that speak something otherworldly of course you also have to be careful because the potential for deception or um, sleight of hand is there as well. Anyway, that takes us through the month. So that's a boatload of transits. I couldn't spend, you know, as much time as I'd like to on each one. Usually I have fewer to work with, and so I will expand more. But this month, I'll be sure to be going through uh, quite a few of them, as many as I can. Um, I hope that you guys will also check out my horoscopes for the month. You can check out your uh, sun or rising sign horoscope. Watch for those videos. Be sure to check back in as your month continues to unfold. Tell me how you're experiencing the transits or tell me how you're seeing them manifest in the, uh, in the news and the headlines. I think it's always interesting to learn from those. 
uh, kinds of experiences. So, all right, that's what I've got. I hope you guys have a great month of August and we'll talk to you again soon.